Well, I, uh, I'm very excited about what I want to share with you today. Somebody, somebody asked me before first service, they said, Pastor, do you ever get uh, nervous before you preach? I said, no, but I get really excited. And today I'm incredibly excited because I think God has a word that's going to change your life today. I've been praying about this thing called the Spirit-Filled Life. We're a Pentecostal church and we talk about spirit, Spirit-Filled Living. What do I mean by that? Now, sometimes, look, God will speak to me through analogies. Does he do that with you? And so this past week, it was in the morning, I'd gotten up, I was fixing my coffee, and I was just kind of thinking about this whole thing of the spirit-filled life, and Lord, what is it? And as I was, you know, just kind of thinking about this, praying about this, right in front of me was this grinder. Now, a couple months ago, I told Darla and the kids, for Father's Day, all I want is a, is a handheld coffee grinder. Because I want to be a coffee purist. And if you're going to be a coffee purist, you got to grind your own coffee beans. And so they got this thing for me. And here's what I thought. I thought I'll put the beans in there. I'll twirl this thing a couple of times and I've got coffee beans. I'm not being facetious. I said this. It takes me eight to ten minutes of grinding this to get enough coffee for one cup of coffee. And I remember the last time I did this, which was, uh, when was Father's Day? This is the day after Father's Day. <laughs> Um, I said, I'm not doing this anymore. My hands are hurting. My wrist is hurting. It's taking me eight to ten minutes. And I finally said, I, I can't do this. And so what I did is I went back to, uh, to my old standby, my electric coffee maker, uh, coffee, coffee grinder. Literally, I can put coffees in, coffee beans in here. I can close this. I can push this button. And in five seconds, I have all the beans I need to make a good cup of coffee. And as I was praying about, you know, this may or may not be from the Lord. Have y'all ever done one of these things where you're, you're tired and you just, you know you've heard from the Lord. And then when you wake up, you're like, what was I thinking? That's not from the Lord. So I, this may or may not be from the Lord. But here's what I was thinking. This right here is the life of the flesh. Me trying through my own effort to live the kind of life I'm supposed to live. To overcome the sins I'm supposed to overcome. To be the father, husband, pastor I'm supposed to be, and I do it through my own pre- uh, uh, of my own strength, that's this lifestyle. That's the flesh lifestyle. The spirit-filled lifestyle is this. I operate on somebody else's power. I do more with less effort. Isn't that what Jesus said? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest. The life of the Spirit is, I just rely not on my own power, but on the power of the Holy Spirit, and I get more done with less effort. That's what I mean by the Spirit-filled life. And so I want us to talk about that for a few minutes today. And some of y'all, listen to this, some of y'all are trying to crank out your marriage problems through your own power. Some of you are trying to crank out holy living on your own. Some of you are trying to crank out a successful business on your own. And Jesus says, you can do that and you'll get to heaven, but you'll be worn out when you get here. I have a better way to do this. In John 14, here's what Jesus says. Now, we don't worship three gods, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We worship one God. Jesus says, I'm leaving this world. And I'm going to not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Well, wait a second. If Jesus died, was buried, came back to life, ascended to the right hand of the Father. How in the world can he come to us? He does it through his Holy Spirit. Romans 8 makes it very clear. The moment you get saved, whether you're Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Methodist, the moment you get saved, Jesus' Holy Spirit comes to live in you, and he will abide with you how long, church? Forever is what Jesus said. Now, you go through the book of Acts, and I can point out at least a half a dozen times in Scripture where people who are saved already, so Jesus' Spirit is living in them, have an additional encounter with the Holy Spirit that we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Spirit. It's in the Bible, incidentally. It is in there. At least a half a dozen times where people who are already born again, already saved, now have the Holy Spirit come upon them a second time with power and authority. Here's what I don't understand. How people who study the Bible the most tend to disagree with this the most. If you believe the Bible, church, y'all believe the Bible, then you have to believe that for those of us who are born again and saved and the Spirit of God is already living in us, there is an additional encounter called the baptism of the Spirit or being filled with the Spirit that is available to us. Now, if you allow His Spirit to fill you, to operate in you, here's some things that will happen. First of all, He will lead you in the way you are to go, John 16, 13. 
I mean, look, have y'all come to these situations at times? you like, do I go this way or do I go that way? Am I supposed to do this or am I supposed to do that? Wouldn't it be great to have a, an eternal GPS, internal GPS system that is smarter than Siri that can tell you the way you're supposed to go? That happened to Paul in the book of Acts. He didn't know if he's supposed to go over here, and it says the, the Spirit of God prevented him, and the Spirit of God opened the door over here. If you'll let the Holy Spirit, he'll lead you. Yeah. Secondly, he will make you bold and confident, Acts 4, 8. He will give you power for living, Acts 1, 8. How many of y'all need power? I need some power today. He will help you overcome sin and addiction, Galatians 5, 16. You don't overcome your addictions by sweating harder and gritting your teeth more. You overcome your addictions not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit. Paul says, walk in the Holy Spirit and you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. It's the Holy Spirit. He will help you to pray, Romans chapter 8. I was talking to a lady this past week who was going to have some major surgery because she was in a catastrophic accident a few years ago. And she said, Pastor, do you know what's interesting? She said the days leading up to and even afterward, people got woken up in the middle of the night by the Holy Spirit saying, you need to pray for Peggy. Something's about to happen. Before it even happened. She said, I can't tell you how many people said the Holy Spirit woke me up and said, pray for Peggy. Isn't that something? If you allow the Holy Spirit, he'll help you to pray. And so what is this this spirit-filled lifestyle that we're talking about? Jot this down in your study guide because this is very important. Being filled with the Spirit is not an event. It's a lifestyle. Here's why we have a lot of immature Pentecostals. Because they are pointing back, they're 60-something years old, they're pointing back to an experience they had at youth camp when they were 16 years old, and they're relying on that. Listen, being filled with the Spirit is not an event. It is a lifestyle. I thank God that you are filled with the Spirit when you're 16 years old. But what you've been doing for the last 50 years since then? Being filled with the Spirit is not an event, it is a lifestyle. I'm going to go back to the Old Testament and kind of illustrate this Spirit-filled life, uh, lifestyle with the story from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, here's what happened. Holy Spirit would come upon God's people and leave. Come upon them and empower them and leave. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I'll give you the Spirit of truth and He will abide with you forever. Old Testament, 538 B.C. God's people are in Babylon. Babylon was the place of their captivity for about 70 years. The Babylonians had come in, they left Babylon, gone to Jerusalem, destroyed God's temple, torn up the whole city, and taken all of God's people into captive. Okay? Now a new king named Cyrus has arisen, and here's what he said to God's people. He said, you've been in captivity for decades. Y'all ready? Go back home. All of you can go back home. And so a wave of 50,000 people left Babylon to go back home to Jerusalem. And two people said, we're going to help God's people rebuild the temple. Those two men were Joshua, not the same Joshua of the conquest, different Joshua. Joshua, he was a priest, and a man named Zerubbabel. These two guys said, together, by the Spirit of God, we will rebuild God's temple. Two of them together, which leads me to my first point. Jot this down. Spirit-filled living is a life of fellowship. It's not just Joshua saying, I'm going to build the temple. It's not just Zerubbabel saying, I'm going to build the temple. These two guys are going to work together and build the temple. Do you know that over 53 times in the New Testament, this phrase is used? One another. Love one another. Carry one another's burdens. Over and over and over again in the New Testament, we find this. That if you're going to live out the Spirit-filled life, you've got to do it in community with other Christians. How many introverts do, you, do we have here like Pastor Chad? I am the most, in, honestly, on the Myers-Briggs things, I'm as, I'm as introverted as you can get. So the fellowship thing does not come easy for me. Why don't you listen to me? I have never seen a spirit-filled believer operating in the power of the Holy Spirit who has lived a life of isolation. Every spirit-filled believer I've ever met has done it with other believers in communities. Does it make sense? In fact, let me read this. I love this little story for you. L- listen to this. A member of a certain church who had previously been attending services regularly just stopped going to church. After a few weeks, the pastor decided to visit him. It was a chilly evening, and the pastor found the man at home sitting before a blazing fire. Guessing the reason for the pastor's visit, the man welcomed him, led him to a big chair near the fireplace, and just waited on the pastor. The pastor made himself comfortable, but he said nothing. After some minutes, the pastor took the fire tongs, carefully picked up a brightly burning ember and placed it to one side of the hearth all by itself. Then he sat back in the chair, silent. The host watched this with quiet fascination. 
as the one lone ember's flame diminished, there was a momentary glow, and then the fire was no more. Soon the ember was cold and as dead as a doornail. Not a word had been spoken since the initial greeting, but just before the pastor was ready to leave, he picked up the cold, dead ember and placed it back in the middle of the fire. Immediately, it began to glow once more with the light and the warmth of the burning coals surrounding it. As the pastor reached the door to leave, his host said, Thank you so much for your visit, and especially for your fiery sermon. I'll see you next week in church. <laughs> Isn't that great? And so Joshua and Zerubbabel said, in community, we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to operate in our life. So they get back to Jerusalem, and they start to work on the temple. And a group of, of Samaritans come to them, and their motives are not pure. And they say to Joshua and Zerubbabel, look, you're trying to do an impossible task. You need our money, and you need our help. Let us help you build the temple. Joshua and Zerubbabel knew that their motives were not good, and they said to these people, no. And as a result, these Samaritans come against God's people and begin to attack them. They stirred up trouble. They discouraged God's people, Ezra 4.3. They frightened the people of God, Ezra 4.4. 4. They spread lies about them to King Cyrus. They send people back to King Cyrus and say, hey, you know what Joshua and Zerubbabel are trying to do? They're trying to stir up trouble, raise an army, and come and kill you, king. I mean, that's the kind of mess they have. And I know Joshua and Zerubbabel said, what's going on? All we're wanting to do is build God's temple. Maybe we got it wrong because of all this opposition. Now, listen to this. Jot this down, number two. Spirit-filled living is a life of warfare. Beloved, I never really understood the reality of demons, of the dark side, of Satan, until I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And suddenly my eyes were open, and I realized, beloved, you do realize we're in a war. Y'all know that? I, 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 listen, I'll hear Christians say this. Well, I started this ministry and all this opposition came against me, then that ministry must not have been of God. What are you cra Look, if there is no opposition, then it's probably not of God. If there is opposition, that means the enemy has summoned his forces and they're coming against you. Well, pastor, I tried this business. There was so much opposition, I just shut it down. It must not have been God. You, you crazy? Maybe the fact that you have opposition means this thing is of God. Church, I love coming to this church, and I love the good times, and I love laughing and goofing off and having a good time. But you never need to forget this. This church is involved in spiritual warfare. We are coming up against the forces of darkness. If you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are in a war. In fact, I, how many Rocky fans do we have here? Remember Rocky? I love all the Rocky movies. Rocky 1 to Rocky 48. I love all of them, okay? And in Rocky 1, remember who, who did he fight in Rocky One? Anybody remember? Apollo Creed. And Apollo Creed is the top boxer. He's the main guy. And he's going to do an exhibition uh, boxing round. And for some reason, the guy he is supposed to box can't do it. And so they get this no-name named Rocky Balboa to come and fight him during the exhibition. Y'all remember this? And, and uh, Apollo's goofing off. He's wearing kind of the Uncle Sam hat because he was doing the patriotic stuff and, you know, red, white, and blue uh, trousers and all this. He's just goofing off and having a good time. That's how Apollo Creed was. And the bell rings and Rocky goes at him. Round one, round two, he's knocking, he's, he's tearing Apollo up. And finally, Apollo goes to his corner and here's what his trainer said. He said, hey, Apollo, you see that guy over there? He doesn't know that this is an exhibition. He thinks this is a real fight. In other words, you better get in gear here. This guy means business. And sometimes, church, I want to say, hey, do you see that Satan over there? He doesn't think this is an exhibition. He actually thinks this is a real warfare. Maybe we ought to take this thing seriously, understand that our, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. If you do anything for God, spirit-filled believers will come up against problems. They'll come up against the enemy. Now, I'm going to say this again. One thing I was not prepared for when I came to the Baptist Church or the Assemblies of God Church was this. Pastor, pray for me. Satan is coming to get me. Pastor, pray for me. The demonic stuff is coming against me. I was not prepared for this defensive mentality that says Satan is great. He's powerful. He's strong. Pray, dear God, that something doesn't happen to me. Can I remind you of something, church? Greater is he who's in you than he who's in this world. 
I got, I remember, I got grilled one time, and I went to uh, the Middle East, went to a prominent synagogue where there's all kinds of weird stuff that had happened, not synagogue, a, uh, a mosque, where all kinds of weird stuff had happened. And I came back, and I told people, I went to that mosque. They said, why did you do that? Weren't you afraid of the demons? What are the de- there's demons in that mosque where those demons came against you. I said, I wasn't afraid of demons. In fact, here's how I looked at that. When I entered that mosque, those demons needed to be afraid of me. Oh, dear Satan, Chad is here. He's filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. I want the enemy to be more afraid of me than I am of the enemy. Does that make sense? And spirit-filled living is a battle of, of epic proportions. So as a result of this opposition, Joshua and Zerubbabel, I'm not quite sure why they did this. They and all the people throw up their hands and say, well, we'll just stop building the temple. And for 16 years, they didn't do anything. And finally, God sends two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. Their writings are in your Bible. In fact, in those days, the the oracles of those prophets were Scripture. Now, today in the church, if somebody here gives a prophetic word, that's not Scripture. You understand this. It's good. It's healthy. It'll encourage you. But that doesn't have the same weight of Scripture, okay? Haggai and Zechariah come, and their words in those days are Scripture. Does it make sense? And it's kind of good cop, bad cop. Zechariah is really nice. Hey, guys, listen, we can do this thing. Let's build the temple. Haggai's kind of the bad cop. He just fusses at everybody and kind of pounds everybody. But both of these prophets come together and say to Zechariah, or pardon me, Zerubbabel, and Joshua, why y'all waiting? Get to work. Which leads me to the next point. Look at this. Spirit-filled living is a life of Scripture. Listen. If you're a spirit-filled believer, you need to feast on the Word of God. I believe there's nothing more unstoppable than a man or a woman filled with the Spirit of God who consumes the Word of God. That's a powerhouse right there. In fact, listen to this great quote. I love this. If you have only the Bible, you will dry up. I've had professors like that. They knew the Bible back and forth. If you have only the Bible, you dry up. If you have only the Holy Spirit, you blow up. But if you have both, you grow up. Isn't that great? And so as a spirit-filled believer, the spirit-filled lifestyle means I feed on the Word of God. It, it, the spiritual life doesn't mean I go onto the Elijah list and see what prophet so-and-so said about Donald Trump this week and let's kind of distribute the Elijah. No, no, the, 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 the spiritual living says, no, I go to the Word of God itself and I read and consume the Word of God. In fact, I love this story. Listen to this. Native American elder once described his own internal struggles in this manner. Here's what this Native American chief said. He said, inside of me, there are two dogs. One of the dogs is mean and evil And the other dog is good. The mean dog fights the good dog all the time. And somebody asked him, well, so which dog wins? He reflected for a moment and said, the one that I feed the most. You feed the flesh, the flesh is going to have power and authority in your life. But you feed the spirit man. You feed that spirit part of you, the word of God. Power is developed in your life. Does that make sense? All right, so Joshua and Zerubbabel get smacked around a little bit by these prophets. It's time to get back to work. And so they said, let's do it. And as they start working to build the temple, God takes Joshua aside. He says, Joshua, I'm going to use you to do a great thing. But we need to have a time out here. Joshua, there are some moral things in your life. You've got to get straight. And so I want you to see this. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Okay, so you got these two guys. Joshua, Zerubbabel, they're about to build the temple. God says, that's great. But Joshua, I, I, need, I need you to come here for just a second. The angel showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser, Satan, was there at the angel's right hand making accusations against Joshua. How many of y'all have that? The enemy does that day and night. That's what the Bible calls him, the accuser, the accuser of the brethren, day and night. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusations, Satan. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. Now, Joshua's clothing was filthy. This is an image of sin, okay? Sin-stained clothes as he stood there before the angel. So the angel said to the others standing there, take off his filthy clothes. And turning to Joshua, he said, see, I have taken your sins, and now I'm giving you these fine new clothes. 
Then I said they should also place a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean priestly turban on his head and they dressed him in new clothes while the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the angel of the Lord spoke very solemnly to Joshua and said this, This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. If you follow my ways and carefully serve me, then you will be given authority over my temple and its courtyards, and I will let you walk among these others standing here. Look at this. Spirit-filled living is a life of purity. Now, the moment you got saved, brother or sister, God did exactly what you're reading right there. He took your filthy clothes and cast them as far as the east is from the west, and he clothed you in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We call that positional righteousness. Okay? But there's also a second kind of righteousness, and it's, it's called this. It's practical righteousness. Positionally, when God looks at me, he sees the purity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Practically, this man still sins every day. And so what God is saying to Joshua is, Joshua, my spirit is going to use you to build that temple, but we got to get some moral things right in your life. Beloved, listen to me. You can't sleep with Satan on Saturday night and then come to church and rebuke Satan on Sunday morning. If you're going to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, there are some things that are off limits for you. There are some movies you can't watch. There's some music you can't listen to. There are some places you can't go if you're going to be a spirit-filled believer that pushes back the kingdom of darkness. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I mean that. In fact, I was reading about, um, when I was a kid, I loved Superman. I was reading about the early Superman radio series, and Superman, they created this superhero, Superman, and the creator said, now, we've got to make him human in, in some way. So we're going to make Superman where there is this element that if that element comes into super, Superman's life, it makes him weak. What's that element called, church? Uh, kryptonite. Now, the early writers of Superman wrote this in, that if kryptonite came into Superman's presence, it not only took away his powers, it took away his powers and gave it to other people, including his enemies. And I thought about this past week, and I said, you know what? Sin is your kryptonite. Every believer in this place, every spirit-filled believer ought to have an S on their chest for spirit-filled, son or daughter of the Most High God. Stop trying to think of another S. Anyway, you ought to have a S on your chest, meaning more than, more than a conqueror. That's you. I want to tell you something. You let this sin mess into your life, not only does it weaken you spiritually, it gives power to your enemy, Satan, to accuse you night and day. Spirit-filled living is pure living. No, let's, let's start winding this thing. I want you to do this. So now it's time for Zerubbabel and it's time for Joshua to build the temple. It's been 16 years they've been trying to do this in their own flesh, and it's not been working. Do you know when they got filled with the Holy Spirit, it only took them four years? Think about that. 16 years in the flesh, four years in the Spirit. I want you to see this thing. I love, look, this is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Zechariah chapter 4. Then the angel who had been talking with me, returned and woke me as though I had been asleep. What do you see now, he asked. I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl of oil on top of it. Around the bowl are, a bowl are seven lamps, each having seven spouts with the wick. And I see two olive trees, one on each side of the bowl. Then I asked the angel, what are these, my Lord? What do they mean? Don't you know? The angel asked. No, my Lord, I replied. Then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain, will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sees the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, may God bless it, may God bless it. Jot this down. Spirit-filled living is a life of power. Now, there's a lot of symbolism right here, so I'm just going to give you a big picture. we got this on, on PowerPoint as well. Here's the big picture. Two olive trees. One symbolizes Zerubbabel. The other symbolizes Joshua. And from these olive trees, there's pipe and an endless supply of oil are coming out of them and lighting this lamp. And what God is saying to them is when this temple is completed, 
It's not going to be because you are stronger, smarter, more powerful. No, it's going to be because you allow the Holy Spirit just to flow through you. Isn't that what Jesus says in John chapter 7? If anybody's thirsty, come to me and let him drink. And out of his innermost being, streams of living water will what, church? Just flow out. And then John says this, by this he meant the Holy Spirit. Spirit-filled living is God doing through you what you cannot do yourself. Now, look. We don't use olive trees, and we don't use olive oil and that kind of thing today. So let me kind of put this in today's terms. It'd almost be like Zechariah saw this image of a nuclear power plant here and a nuclear power plant there, and behold, wires were coming out of a nuclear power plant, and they were lighting up entire cities. God is saying to you, to me, to Joshua, to Zerubbabel, the spirit-filled life is me flowing my power through you. I'm just looking for willing vessels for me to flow through. That's a spirit-filled life. And, and I love this. Look there if you go to verse 7. Nothing, not even a mountain can stand in your way when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. I told you this before. One of the most irritating things I hear Christians say this. Hey, John, how are you doing today? Just hanging in there. And I want to say, Jesus Christ was not torn to shreds and hung on a cross for six hours so you can spend the rest of your life hanging there like a bat on the side of a cave. No, Jesus Christ died and came back and rose again to make you more than a conqueror through him who loves you. That's the spirit-filled life we're talking about. Let me, let me go out with one more thing. I've got I to share this. So the temple is built in four years, and most of the people are really happy. There's a few people, I'm not making this up, there's a few people who are sad. And you, they, they're like, hey, we're dedicating the temple. God did this through Joshua, through Zerubbabel. Why are you crying? Here's what they said. Well, I remember Pastor Solomon's temple. It was a lot nicer than that. I, I remember the church when it used to be, you know, 70 years ago. It was a lot nicer than this today. And Zechariah comes to God and he says, God, I've done all this work. Most people are happy, but I'm getting some grief because my temple is not as nice as Solomon's temple. And God says this, I think it's in Zechariah 4.10. He says, look, don't look down on the day of small beginnings. In other words, hey, hey, Zechariah, I'm doing something right now that you can't even see. What Zechariah doesn't realize is years later, John, when he writes the book of Revelation, he will go back to this event and he'll pull from this event and he talks about end time prophecies using what has happened here. And one up on that is Matthew and Luke will trace the, the lineage of Jesus, the Messiah. And do you know who their great, great, his great, 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 great grandfather is? Zerubbabel, the man that built this temple. Here's what God is saying. Spirit-filled believers live a life of faith. Things may look dark now. Job might not be going the way you think it ought to go. Family situation seems to be falling apart. But God is saying, hey, my Holy Spirit is working behind the scenes. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Just rest in me. I'm taking care. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. So let me close with this. I told you before, I love closing. That's why I do it ten times every sermon. I love closing. I told you a little while back that the best description of spirit-filled living I heard several years ago, when I heard the story of David Livingston, the, the famous missionary, who had heard about Charles Spurgeon, the famous pastor in England. And so Livingston is home in England on vacation, on furlough. He says, I want to follow Charles Spurgeon around for a couple of days because I've heard all about his church, his orphanage, everything that's going on. And he followed Spurgeon around for a few days. And when the days are over, they go back to Spurgeon's office. Livingston just kind of collapses on the couch. He says, Pastor Spurgeon. He said, I don't understand it. He said, what do you don't understand? He said, man... You do the work of two people. Spurgeon says, you forget. There's two of us working. That's a spirit-filled life right there. It's not just you trying to fulfill Jesus' commands on your own. No, there's two of you working. That's the spirit-filled life. In fact, go back to verse 7. I, I'm going to read this one more time. I love verse 7. Zerubbabel, Joshua, y'all are called to do an impossible task. But look at this. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain, will stand in your way. Implication, when a mountain pops up, we're not going to flank and go around that mountain. No, we're going to push that mountain out of the way. Somebody needs to hear that prophetic word right here today. Somebody needs to hear me say this. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain, is going to stand in your way today. Some of y'all are trying to move the mountain of divorce, and it's not budging. But when you're filled with the Spirit, 
Now there's two of you working, and the mountain of divorce will be pushed out of the way. Some of you are trying to move the mountain of addiction, and it's not working. But when you're filled with the Spirit, there's now two of you working, and the mountain of addiction cannot stand in your way. Some of you are trying to move the mountain of anxiety, and brother, it ain't budging. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's now two of you working, and that mountain cannot stand in your way. Some of y'all have been trying to move the mountain of depression for a long time, and it's not moving. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's now two of you working, and the mountain of depression cannot stand in your way. Will the church of the living God thank the living God for the mighty power of the Holy Spirit that is available for God's people today? Church, I mean this. I want you to stand up with me right now. Is there anybody in this place that you got a mountain in front of you and you're tired of sweating and groaning and grunting trying to push this thing and you're ready for the Holy Spirit just to flow through you? You are one of those olive trees. You are one of those nuclear power plants. And God says, I want to do through you what you cannot do yourself. It's not by might nor by power, but by my Holy Spirit flowing through you. I'm going to ask this. For believers, and this is me, who have already been filled with the Holy Spirit, but need a fresh wave, a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to come right now. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit before and you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, do you know Jesus says in Luke, he says, hey, this is a promise of the Father. This is a gift from the Father. You don't earn it. You don't achieve it. You receive it. I need a fresh infilling, a fresh empowerment of the Holy Spirit. If you've got some mountains coming up in your life that don't seem to be moving and they don't seem to be responding to your power, if you've got, I'm going to say that if you have some demonically constructed mountains that have set themselves up in your life and they're laughing at you. And you need the Holy Spirit of God to flow through you and knock the mountains down. You need a fresh infilling of the Spirit. I want you to come and here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship for a few moments. When I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, it was in the context of worship. I was worshiping Jesus when the Holy Spirit just washed over me. And so I want us just to worship and in a few moments after worship has kind of gotten going, I'm going to come up and I'm going to pray for you. Here's what Jesus said. How much more will the Father give the Spirit to them that what? Ask. Can you ask God for the Spirit? Let's not make this thing harder than we have to. We're going to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we're going to come and ask for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I believe God's going to knock some mountains down today, not by your might nor by your power, but by the Holy Spirit of the living God. Worship the Lord right now. Let's worship.